Okay, well, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, of course, the passing of a great leader in uh, science is, uh, and a great person is a sad event, but it's also an event where we come together as a community and uh, have a chance to think about what we're doing and um, the fact that we are a community. And in that regard, I think uh, uh, Roberto is a very, very special figure. He was international. He uh, very much reflected the international traditions of science and the best of the old world. And he brought it to the world. And uh, I always felt when I was that uh, I was immersed in uh, a cultural ambiance that uh, was uh, very special and that he was really one of the best representatives that our community possibly could have had. And the fact that he took on such prominent uh, administrative roles and took on that leadership burden was another testament to his strength of character. Today, I'm going to talk, however, about uh, Peche Quint and, 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 uh, and, and Axions, which perhaps is his central uh, scientific legacy. And I'll talk not about the fundamental particle physics, which Helen introduced, but about the ramifications of these ideas in other areas of physics, which are quite amazing and maybe unanticipated and are driving research around the world today. <clears throat> so I think it's appropriate to start with this quotation from Heinrich Hertz. He was speaking of the Maxwell equations, but I think much the same thing could be said about the equations that Roberto and Helen uh, bequeathed to us, one cannot escape the feeling that these mathematical formulae have an independent existence and an intelligence of their own, that they are wiser than we are, wiser even than their discoverers, that we get more out of them than was originally put into them. Uh, they really, I think they, uh, they transmitted a message from heaven, from God, <laughs> with, with these equations. And I'll try to show you some aspects of why I think that. <clears throat> the deepest innovation, I think, uh, I should say, I won't be able to do justice as I won't actually show you the equations, uh, but uh, I will try to convey the idea and the spirit of them. The uh, central innovation, I would say, uh, that can be expressed at a non-technical level and is the deep structure of the peche quinn symmetry is that it brought ideas from the theory of evolution into uh, our understanding of fundamental physics. What happens in the peche quinn mechanism is that an, other, an, an otherwise mysterious coincidence about the world gets explained dynamically. And here's a picture that's portrays it very elegantly. Uh, there's a special place where the universe is, and uh, we have to explain why it's there. So th this is the vanishing of the theta parameter that uh, Helen mentioned. And their idea was that uh, one way to have that happen is that the good place is a place where energy is minimized. It's where uh, things want to settle down to. So wherever you start, within the framework of the symmetry they proposed, you will end up at the good place. But on the way down, some interesting things can happen, as you'll see. Now, let me introduce a totally, at first sight, totally different topic, but turns out to be deeply related, we hope and think. Many astronomical and cosmological observations point towards the existence of something called dark matter. 
dark matter is not dark in the conventional sense of English. It's matter that we don't see at all, so it's transparent, and we have not been able to see it so far in any way uh, that's known to astronomy. It doesn't emit light, doesn't absorb light, doesn't emit cosmic rays, and so forth. Uh, but uh, it has been seen only through its gravity. Nevertheless, uh, gravity acts on very different scales in many different ways, and a uh, tremendous number, variety of observations can be explained if we postulate in a uniform way, if we postulate the existence of an additional component of the universe, which is very, very weakly interacting with ordinary matter. That's why it's dark or rather transparent, uh, but still weighs and behave in many ways like, in, in relevant ways like uh, all matter. Einstein taught us that the force of gravity is universal in its effect. And so uh, the details of what the matter is don't matter very much as long as it, uh, it interacts gravitationally in a normal way and can't be seen uh, through and its interact, other interactions with ordinary matter are sufficiently weak. Now, I, as I mentioned, there are many, many lines of evidence for the existence of this dark matter. Uh, let me just show one that's particularly visual and beautiful and so appropriate for this kind of presentation. Uh, this is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, where, which looks like it's been taken through the bottom of a Coke bottle. You see that there's an obvious uh, distortion that uh, the image has somehow been uh, put through a lens or some kind of uh, processing. The light hasn't traveled in straight lines to us. And this can be explained in terms of the existence of dark matter because gravity bends light. And uh, therefore, if there is gravity, uh, due to the existence of large amounts of dark matter, it will bend the light. And if you work out quantitatively uh, this uh, phenomenon, you found, find that you need dark matter to explain this and other images of its kind. And it, there's a, there are many uh, consistent aspects of how it's distributed and how much there is in different places in the sky, which leads us to strongly suspect that it really is a new kind of particle, a new kind of matter that's produced in the early universe. In fact, uh, when you work at quantitatively how much you need, you find that dark matter provides a large fraction of the mass of the universe, much more than normal matter, about six times as much as uh, the normal matter that we think of as making galaxies that, that we have been studying in astronomy for centuries, but we don't know what it is. We know what it weighs by uh, its gravitational effect, but we'd like a better picture of what it is. Mm -hmm. And this leads to a beautiful question. Uh, is this new particle that uh, resulted from the peche quinn theory of uh, addressing fundamental issues in basic physics, is it possible that because of uh, the way it behaves in the early universe and uh, gets produced, uh, could it be the dark matter? <clears throat> uh, I showed you earlier a picture of the world settling down from an arbitrary place into the good place. Uh, according to the Peche Quinn mechanism, uh, that process, that winding down of the value of the theta parameter and the Peche Quinn field, which carries it uh, down to the good place, uh, it releases energy as as it proceeds. In fact, it proceeds by the relax by the emission of very very light particles of these axions. And when you work it out, you find amazingly that this gas of axions produced during the Big Bang 
has properties that are remarkably consistent with what we want for dark matter. So it, it uh, is produced cold, that's important in detail. It's produced in the right amount to provide the dark matter and the axions are predicted to interact appropriately weakly with ordinary matter. So there's, I wouldn't say compelling, but strong circumstantial evidence that uh, it's very interesting to consider that axions might be the dark matter of the universe. Uh, or to put it another way, uh, is the fact that these calculations yield a dark matter candidate that came from entirely different considerations, a profound discovery about the nature of the universe or just a cruel coincidence? Every minds want to know. And it's not just me. The whole community is obsessed with this question, as I'll show you. Uh, the, uh, to introduce the, the following pictures, here's a cartoon version of the search for axions. You want uh, axions, as I said, interact with matter very weakly, but in predictable ways. And the theory tells you uh, about how they interact with matter. And so uh, if you're clever, you can try to exploit the theory to predict what a good way to uh, detect axions is. This is very, very similar to the, to the challenge that faced Heinrich Hertz, the experimentalist whose quote uh, started this talk, when he had to design antennas to test Maxwell's theory of electrodynamics, the beautiful equations he was talking about. There wasn't such a thing as an antenna. There wasn't such a thing as radio. He had to take the theory and develop it in order to uh, produce those things. And here we face a similar kind of challenge. We have these beautiful equations. We have potentially a tremendous component of the physical universe. And the challenge is to use those equations to design appropriate antennas that will detect it and close the loop on this potentially glorious story. And uh, this illustrates the lengths to which people are ready to go to do this. This is the IAXO project at CERN. And you see uh, it's a gigantic object. You, you can see the little person there to give a scale. Uh, and it's meant to be movable, so it always points at the sun. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the magnitude of this undertaking sort of speaks for itself and how compelling the community thinks these ideas may be. <clears throat> uh, this is an existing project, the, uh, the, the, which is up and running, the ADMX collaboration, which uh, works at very, very low temperatures in strong magnetic fields and is particular antenna design, which is very clever. And they are uh, at present at the cutting edge of getting into the kinds of sensitivity you need to uh, detect this, this axion background, if it's there. This is another beautiful design. Uh, this is the so-called Abracadabra project, which is a gigantic superconducting uh, object that, uh, well, looks, looks appropriate for detecting dark matter uh, and produces gigantic magnetic fields and again, uh, the idea is that axions in those magnetic fields convert into uh, photons that you can detect. <clears throat> uh, this is another one that I've been in, involved in recently, uh, which is the use of kinds of in, uh, metamaterials, so specially constructed materials, strings of, of uh, wires that are uh, especially designed antennas, again, to pick up axions in the early universe. And people are building this at Berkeley now. <laughs> uh, axions also introduce, if they exist, uh, uh, and this is kind of a lead in to the next development, they also exist, uh, interact not only with the electromagnetic field, but with uh, particles of the more conventional kind, with, uh, in particular, the spins of particles and do unusual things. And this is another big area of investigation. 
with uh, experiments being mounted. Another, so the search for the axions as dark matter is ongoing. It has not yet broken through to a successful conclusion, but I think it's fair to say that it's now and in the next uh, several years going to be the time of testing for these ideas, the sensitivities that people have been able to design for the antennas are finally reaching the levels where they have a chance, despite the very weak interaction of the axions, to detect them. Another direction in which these equations have proved beautiful and fruitful is in the description of ordinary matter, matter that you find in laboratories. Well, it's not so ordinary. It has to be at low temperature, it's at special materials, but, uh, but actual matter in the tradition of superconductivity and transistors that uh, are qualitatively new that occur in matter when it's uh, under the appropriate conditions. And these equations lead us to uh, suggest such conditions. In these applications, the so-called axions are not the fundamental particle axions, but objects, emergent uh, uh, excitations, emergent entities within the theory that obey the same equations as those axions with different parameters. They share many qualitative features with the fundamental axions, but are much more easily accessible. So I've been at this for a long time. This is one of the early efforts in that regard, just to show the fruitfulness of these ideas, of the underlying ideas of Petri Quinn theory. And uh, this has become a very hot topical uh, effort in condensed matter physics, so-called topological insulators. It turns out that topological insulators embody very tangibly uh, the equations of axion electrodynamics. And so uh, this was in a way an answer in search of a question, but nature has provided the question. <laughs> And it's not just speculation. These things have actually uh, been observed in beautiful experiments. And they're gener this, this class of ideas is generating new ideas for new kinds of materials. Uh, I don't even know what this is, frankly, but I pulled it down off the web. Something called an axion insulator, which people are designing. So new kinds of materials that turn what used to be uh, metals into insulators and that thing that can be very very useful if you have a way of turning a metal into an insulator because that's also known as a switch and if you're doing microelectronics it's very useful to have things that you can turn on and off so i'll just i hope that gives you a flavor i tried to do as much as i could uh, without actually writing down any equations to give you a flavor of how fruitful and special uh, these equations have been. And I'd just like to close by coming back again to this quotation by Heinrich Hertz. I won't read it again, but I hope you remember. And I do think that it applies not only to the Maxwell equations that uh, Hertz was speaking about, but to uh, the equations that Petsy and Quinn have bequeathed to us. And so I want to thank Helen. I want to thank Roberto. And I also want to thank uh, the good Lord for producing uh, these equations. And uh, it's, again, I think a, a really fortunate thing that such wonderful equations came from such wonderful people. And thank you again.